All the distractions and all the persecutions of the Jewish people started with a fight with Hashem. All the Jewish enemies decided to fight a melchome, a war with Hashem. How did they do it? The first thing they started was to destroy the Beis Hamikdash, the Jewish temple, God's home, where he rested among us. Once they distracted the Beis Hamikdash, they distracted, they destroyed our morals. Then they had an easy time to exile us to Babylon, to Babylonia. The second base of Mikdash was destroyed. Also the same way there was a fight against Hashem. They didn't start with the Jews, they started with Hashem. Then they had an easy job to exile them to Rome, to enslave them. We'll go fast to a few of those. We will take the Inquisition in Spain. It was a fight against Hashem, against the Jewish religion. Accept Christianity. King Ferdinand and Queen Isabel the decree that the Jewish people that had a wonderful life in Spain, that they should converse to Christianity. And it was a terrible thing, but it was no comparison to the Holocaust. Because the law was convert to Christianity or get out. Unfortunately, in the Holocaust, there's no get out. It only was get into the gas chambers and nobody get, got out. So always the fight started with Hashem. Now what happened in the Holocaust? How did it start with Hashem? Yemach Shemoy Hitler said, the Jews are not the chosen people. We, the Aryan, the pure Aryan race is the chosen people. Blonde hair, blue eyes, that's what we are, the chosen people. And then we know what happened. <laughs> Something that happened in all those Holocaustes, in all those destructions, was no comparison to the Holocaust. Because the Holocaust was something to erase the Jewish people from the faith of the earth. And who was Hitler? We know usually that a leader grows from his leading. In American terms, we'll say if someone is a, a congressman, he could become a president, or he has to be a senator, or he has to be a governor, or a, a general. <coughs> Hitler was Nobody. He was a lousy painter in an Austrian village that I have visited. He was till the end a corporal, a just a food goer. And on the other hand, the German people that say at that time were the most cultural, most educated people in the world. There was no other nation that could compare to the German nation. The Germans were the best in every field. They were the highest scientists, they had the biggest doctors, 
that the biggest, I am a member of in Poland, where I, where I was born and grew up. If someone was very, very sick and they couldn't find any pro professor in Poland, go to Berlin, everything, that was the greatest. So on one hand, German was the greatest, Hitler was nobody. They couldn't find anyone, any Einstein, for example, to lead the German nation. They had to find such an imbecile that was no one. How do we understand that? Hard to understand. On one hand, in Poland there was a lot of Hasidim, not so many Litvaks. Hasidim. And you know that a Hasid doesn't know, do anything without consulting with the Rebbe. Whether it is in a business affair, whether it is in Shiduchim, whatever it might be the case, they would go to the Rebbe to consult. When we, I was a child, I overheard stories that I remember. People were murmuring, people were afraid, people were shivering. We heard what had happened in Germany in the 30s, in the early 30s, when he came to power. And we saw all those persecutions starting up, starting up, and every time more and more and more. And then became a problem in Poland because the Nazis did uh, deport the Ostjuden, that they called the Jews of the East. The Jews in the East was a lot of poverty. The Stettlach and all those uh, Polish uh, Stettlach towns, there were a lot of poverty. So people were looking for greener pasture, we would call it, but their better life. The better life was more in the West. West, uh, Belgium, Holland, France, Germany. Germany was top. A lot of Polish Jews, there's statistics that about 160,000 emigrated to uh, Germany, found a much better life, and we saw in it a bruche in a klule. The bruche was that they had a better life. The klule was assimilation, conversion. At the olden times was not intermarriage. The style was conversion to Christianity. There was statistic about close to a hundred thousand. And what happened later on? Their children, their grandchildren, great grandchildren didn't know that they were Jewish. But I'm jumping a little bit. Hitler found them. The last transport, about 20,000 Goyim, was sent to the gas chambers to Birkenau, Auschwitz Birkenau. And they were yelling and screaming, What do you want from our life? Where do you take us? They didn't know that they're going to die. But the Nazis told them, you have Jewish blood in your vein, third, fourth generation. So Hitler was, decided that he will erase the Jewish nation from the face of the earth. There was no anything like it in the history of the Jewish people. There was the, the Crusaders, there were so many, there were pogroms in, in Eastern Europe. But when we saw that they deported the Jewish Ostjuden to Poland, there was all in the shuls appeals taking those people because they came naked and barefoot. The way they stand, they couldn't take anything with them. I remember in our house we had on the floor sleeping uh, a family, a couple with children. Um, so Jews started to be very, very afraid, I said before. 
and we all shivered and people started to get together. It used to be people, five, six people went out of shul, standing and talking, what do you think, what is it going on, what is going to happen, what do we have to do? So, people decided, we'll go to the rabbis. They will ask the rabbis what to do. And to the great disappointment, all the rabbis, like they would come from a general assembly, had one answer. And the answer was, Poilin, a play of words. Poilin and Poilon. Stay here, in other words. People didn't run, people didn't go. When we look now back at the time, People did what they had to do. There was one rabbi <laughs> that was known, the guy rabbi was always advertising, make propaganda, go to Elsie Square, go to Elsie Square. They actually, a lot of gather went to Elsie Square. But it was not possible to go to Elsie Square because a certificate cost a few hundred dollars and nobody had a few hundred dollars at that time. And also the British didn't let in the people the twelve as well. It was very, very difficult. So on one hand, what do we see? Now let's match that puzzle. And let's see what happened. On one hand, we saw now, we, we see now that the Rabbi Noishe Loilon blamed the Tzadikim. He blinded their eyes, they couldn't see the future and said to the people, stay here, on one hand. On the other hand, a nobody came up, a name Hitler, but nobody at all, and made a home a destruction, six million Jews. I say that I have not enough tears for the six million Jews, but we should know there was over 54 million People died in the Holocaust, the World War II. So what do we see? On one hand we see the rabbis didn't know what to do. Came an imbecile and made a home. Came from nowhere, disappeared to nowhere. They couldn't even, in that exploded bunker that they were sitting there, the, 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 he with his uh, friend, uh, Eva Brown and, and all those uh, officers, they all blow themselves up. They couldn't even identify the bones which were his. So what do we see? The Rabbi Nishan Loilam put up a Malach that to, to do a terrible job, and he did. He was almost here. Marshal Hall was already here on the Sinai. A little longer would have been a big call. I had, a few weeks ago, in Yom HaShoah, they decided, the Israelis decided to invite all the ambassadors from the European countries. And I don't know why they had to find me to speak to them. I was trying to get out and I couldn't. They couldn't find, because from Poland, there is hardly any survivors now. There are survivors from Hungary, Romania, certain other countries, but Albania, Greece, Poland, there was a five years of killing. And they did a tremendous job. Poland was about four million Jews. They killed more than 99%. After the war, they were left at a little trickle. And today, there's hardly you can find a, I found one in Tel Aviv. I, 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 I traveled a few weeks ago to Tel Aviv to find one on Polish survival. In 1975, in, uh, no, in, uh, no, in uh, 2021, we were invited to go to, our, to Auschwitz to celebrate. Oh, that's my grandson here. He was with me. Uh, we went to celebrate the liberation of Auschwitz by the Red Army, by the Soviet Union. <coughs> there were hundreds, 
Holocaust survivors, they were about three or four Polish survivors among the hundred. Because we started, the, the, the persecutions started early. We had worked through years, five years through the terrible situation. And uh, the Hungarian Jews had a little bit more muzzle. They started in the summer, June uh, 1944. And, and in those six, they were liberated six months before us. I was liberated by the Americans. They were liberated by the Soviets six months in, in January 27. So there was a lot of more survivors. I remember when they brought in Hungarian Jews to Austria. And we were already hardly walking. You can count every rib. We were skin and bone. But when they came in, we saw people, we saw people with flesh, fresh. We thought they came from the moon somewhere. We didn't know that, that, that people exist like that anymore. So there are survivors from Hungary, yeah. But to tell you to survive the Holocaust is Nissen Veniflaur. Miracles, miracles, miracles. Every day, when we were assembled on the Aspenplatz, when we were woken up by the siren, when it was still dark, we assembled on the Aspenplatz, and that, then they divided us to work, and the danger started, because we prayed that we should be able to survive the day. For what? Because those Nazis, they were murderers. If he doesn't, for anything, for any reason or no reason, he went through the camp to the Appellplatz, which is the, the square where we are assembled. And if he doesn't like somebody or, or for some sport, he would take out his gun and put them down. Two rows for me when I stood in Plashov. This is a concentration camp in Krakow. I'll come back to it. He passed by Amon Gert when he came. He was the murderer, the called the butcher of pleasure. When he passed by on his trek, on his trek, he left a few people there. Just for sport, just for nothing. Two rows for me, there was a man. When he passed by, he said, step out and said in German, I'll translate. I cannot take it that you looking so handsome. Well, well, well. The name was Schlomer Spielmann. So we prayed to survive the day, beating, just for nothing. All the SS murderers. This was, this, they were, loyal servants of, of Hitler. That's why they, they, the SS, they were special. And beating up people for nothing. Work hard, work hard. We did everything we could with our little power, with our little strength that was left in us, but they will beat us up. Other people, for starvation, hunger, Constantly hunger, nothing. A little sixteen of a loaf of a bread, a small bread, not a big one. A sixteen, you have to live with it. And a little soup. The soup was like dishwasher. Yeah, when you wash a dish, a little, uh, you know, uh, you can hardly find anything there. How could we survive? In the morning, we pray, pray that we should survive the day. At night. We should have been happy, go to, to our, wherever we were in the barrack, to sleep, we should be happy because we worked so hard, we had a terrible day, at, at least we'll sleep. So we pray to be day, why? I have to scratch myself when I remember. The lice were eating up our life. The, uh, the lice were eating us alive. They were biting and eating terrible pain a whole night. 
they creep under your skin. We were a whole night not sleeping, but killing lies, killing, picking them, picking them for everywhere. We prayed to be they. So there was your loy young, loy loy. Can you imagine in summertime we just went through a heat a heat wave in, the, in Israel in, in, uh, last last week? Can you imagine standing on a free field in the summertime where the sun was burning you? Not burning, baking you, baking you. Mama is baking you. Without a drink, people fell, people fell, didn't get up. How could you, in, in winter time, the snowstorms, they almost carried you away. The, 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 the snow, when it comes down, becomes like ice. It hits you all over the face. And in your thin pashak, that we call it, that striped, clothes that we had there, very thin, made out of paper. Without a hot drink, without anything. How could you survive? <coughs> Can you imagine having something to, to a person that he should be able to survive? So what I'm saying, it's just miracles. Miracles that there were some people left. And that was happening every single day. They took us from Plashov, where there was that big murderer called the Butcher of Plashov. His name was Amon Gerd. Whoever from you saw Schindler's List saw him. They are shooting on a mother with a baby. The mother was he shot, but the baby survived. <coughs> Amon Gerd. This was a terrible, terrible murderer. He took me with another few thousand people, maybe, and packed us in, in a train, sent us from Plashov to Auschwitz. He put in, in a cattle car 160 men. 160 men in a cattle car. Did you ever see a cattle car? Cattles, they put in three, four, five. Men, you could put, if you put in 60, six zero, you will hardly breathe. So they pushed in 160 men in those cattle cars. We were in those cattle cars for two days and two nights in the hottest day of the summer. And every time I had to climb higher, every day, every few hours, People falling, never get up. People falling. After two days, two nights, I was touching the roof. The whole thing, is, everybody was lying down. When they unlocked that cattle car in Auschwitz, we walked out 20 people. 140. My first job in Auschwitz was to carry the bodies to the crematoriums. When I go now, I went many times to Auschwitz and to Poland. They took me to, to teach groups and show them. So I showed them where I carry those, those bodies, where I put them, on which place. And so, so that was, that take, took a lot of time, it took a few weeks, maybe two weeks to clean the bodies. And then we had to wash the trains, clean the trains. <coughs> and then I had a lot of muzzle and a lot of, a lot of miracles. <coughs> With all the, I was a young boy at the time, a little boy. All the young people, they took and sent them to Birkenau, to the gas chambers. I have seen collecting them, selecting them. And I, by a miracle, were in that surviving group from that train. From every cattle car, they went out between 15 to 30, an average. Some cattle cars, only 50, 
some 30. So we were like uh, two, three hundred people there working, the, cleaning the beds and, where, and then washing the, uh, the, the, the trains. After that, they took us, the head group, they needed people at the time, because they brought people at transport and they brought them straight into the gas chambers. Uh, so they didn't use a lot of those people. Since we were people working here, the engineer said that the earth now, the surface of the land was a little moist. So they advised them to dig around Birkenau ditches. If you go there, you will see around the ditches. You will see their packed pictures, and I found myself on those pictures, digging those ditches. So they took that same group to dig those ditches. Another miracle, because I was among the group, that's how I, I was missile from from the, from the murderers. From there, they sent us to another Ghanaian, called Mauthausen. Mauthausen was a camp that we were work, working in quarries, chopping granite rocks putting them on your shoulders, walking up 184 stairs with those boulders, with those rocks. No, not too many people make it to the top. And on the way, there were SS people with, with whips. Go faster, move, move, faster. In German, mach doch ja hin, mach doch ja hin. Go faster. A lot of people turned around and they, they rolled over and came down on the, to the bottom in pieces. Miracles, miracles, miracles. From there, they sent us to another camp, was called Melk. What did we do there? there? There we dug, we dug tunnels in the Alp Mountains, you know the high mountains, they are the, in the borders between France, you take Mont Blanc, you have Switzerland, Astro, Austria, a few of those uh, uh, countries uh, border with the Alp Mountains. They took us to the Alp Mountains to dig tunnels. So with that, again, <coughs> digging tunnels. What were the tunnels for? Tens of thousands of people died in those, in the, in the digging those tunnels. What were they for? To hide their weaponry, their, their munitions against the Allied bombardment. So there we were working this and it was a terrible commandant called Julius Ludorf, who was a barber by, by profession. And there I had a big miracle. When we lined up every morning, I was in terrible fear always, because I was always short, I'm still short. I never grew. And what they did, is the short people they put in the front and the tall people like uh, steps, you know, the tall people in the back. I had always, my heart was always beating, it was always scared because standing in the front and those SS went through and made an inspection and they went through and they always, they always, for any reason, they're not going to the back to, to, to kill or to, to, to beat them up, but in the front, yes. So until that entourage didn't go by me, I was shivering. When they passed me, ah, a sigh of relief. The day came, 
And as they passed there, in front of me stopped the murderer, the big murderer, Julius Ludov, the commandant of the group. And when I looked at him, I see myself dead. So what did I do? I got up and knocked my two wooden shoes, gave a big noise, and saluted him like this. Saluted him, gave him a rank, I knew the rank, I gave him a few ranks hi higher, <laughs> and I told him, I will polish your boots, they'll shine like the sun. I, I didn't have nothing but to lose. And he looks at me with that sour face and turns it up around to his chavre, to his assess. And I thought that I saw a little smile on his face. I thought so. And they passed, they went, passed away. They went through. Maybe uh, 10 minutes later, an assessment came and said, come. I started being afraid again. And then I said to myself, if you wanted to kill me, who stopped him? He could have done it right away. And he comes with a rifle, with a bayonet on, on the front. Come! He takes me out of the camp, I fall. And we walk up on a hill, and on top of the hill there was a villa, a beautiful home. He opens it and said, get in. So I got in. Nobody, there, nobody was there. And I sat down. He locked the door, he went away. Maybe an hour later, I'm sitting, 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 thinking to myself, what's going to happen? What, what, what is it? What's going on? About an hour later, the big murderer comes in. I again stand up and salute him and And said to him, I want to polish the shoes, I want to shine them. He didn't talk, but <clears throat> he showed me on a, something, on a cabinet, and he went away. I took out the shoes. I just polished them, polished them. I want to make a very good job in order that I saw some sort of, some sort of salvation. He came down, and I showed him the, the boot, as not one pair, two pairs or something. I shine them. He said, come. He takes me out to a garden. There are all kinds of animals in the garden. Two uh, deer, monkeys. Um, I had a big cage of rabbits. And tells me, every day feed the rabbits with carrots. When I heard carrots, I, 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 I told myself, I was talking to myself, I will be the first rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> whoever saw carrots, whoever heard about them. And then chickens, the grains, give them the laugh. Anyway, I did it, and when I heard every word that he said, it was like to lahavdu, to interpret it, <laughs> Arashi or something, every day. I said, every day? Oh my God, that is, that is a such thing, Geula, a redemption, a redemption. Every day. So I worked for that Menubu every day. He beat me up many times for nothing. Just slap, slap, slap. All right, that, that was nothing, that was okay. I had everything. And then I figured there was so much thrown in the garbage. They had so much. How do I get all those things to? There's so many people around me in the, in the barrack that are starving. So I, used, I started taking a little bit. Taking, I was afraid they're going to, to search me when I come into the camp. Then he gave an order that nobody has to take me 
I can walk myself because they have uh, observation hours. They could see me going out from the camp. When I came to the gate, the gate opened and I walked up the hill. There was grass on the hill and on top of the hill was that house. They could see me, the, where will I go, where will I run, somewhere in the, in the wilderness there. Anyways, I started drinking a little bit. Then I, I saw that they don't search me, I brought more. I emptied all the garbages. He had guests every night, he had guests, men, women, and celebrating. And I had to clean all that. And there was so much. I, I, in, that, in that uniform that we had, and that striped one, that did, there wasn't much where to put things. I had to, I had to find a wire, and I made from the wire, cut it in two, tied my pants, and stuffed my pants full with food, full with everything. I came into the camp. I remember some some Jewish people, or only guy with Jewish people. <coughs> uh, they said, Yosef, you are like Yosef in Mitzrayim, you are supplying God. I, 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 that was my biggest, biggest chus that I ever, ever had to bring and to give Machai and Jewish people that they, I'm sure that a lot of them, it helped them a lot to survive. And that's what I did. And I helped other people with, with jobs, uh, I knew already everybody there in the camp who is, who is uh, the, 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 the writer, the, the bookkeeper of the camp. And then also in the barrack, when I came in with food and started to give around to the people, the, the block eldest, that means the head of that barrack, was a German. A German, and uh, not a prisoner, uh, not a, a German soldier, but a prisoner for crimes, anti-Nazi, or whatever other crimes that. So he came over to me and said, I'm going to denounce you, what are you doing here? You're giving her a... I said, shh, don't talk, talk. What do you need? So he gave me a list, what do you need? So I had it already in my pocket, I could do whatever I want. So it was, that was Mamisha Savior, that I could help so many people. But it, it didn't last forever. Then they sent us to another camp called Ebenzei. And in Ebenzei, we did the same thing that we did in Melk. Also, tunnels were already built, and we had to put shelves there and put armaments on those shelves. When I made my movie, we rerun all those places that I'm telling you. And we went to that to those tunnels, and to the, my greatest surprise, we were working in a place, digging the rocks and taking them out in one place. But I, to my great surprise, I found out that eight kilometers of tunnels, eight. I started walking and walking. I was afraid I'm going to get lost. I came back, and there was a lady sitting there and. Uh, she wants to give me a ticket by the entrance of the tunnel. Uh, I said, the ticket I'll take, but I won't pay you. What do you mean? A German uh, woman. What do you mean you won't pay me? I said, you have to pay me because I damned those tunnels. You know what? And if I would have dug those tunnels, you wouldn't have a job. <laughs> because I dug the tunnel, you have a job here, you see. Anyway. This was all before the war and during the war. And we'll say a capital. Uh, I'll say the uh, thing from, from the Holocaust. And then I will tell you a little bit about after the Holocaust. Talking about before the war and a little bit about the war. And we'll talk a little bit about after the war. <coughs> when I survived the war, the Holocaust, of 
course, the first thing that I went, trying to get back from Austria, I would say this is near the Bavarian border, trying to get back to Poland, dreaming, hoping all the years in the camps that the day will come and I'll come back home. My father, my mother, my siblings, my mishpoche, uncles, and cousins, like it used to be. That was always my dream during the Holocaust. And after when I survived, I wanted to go back. And I came back to Poland, struggled through different countries, came back to our house, <coughs> went to our apartment, the janitor that was living in the basement moved up to our apartment. She saw me, she recognized me, come in, gave me a glass of water. I would need a glass of water here too, but I spoke once in a place, I won't mention where, uh, it was on tissue booth, and I, and I said, I would, <laughs> a glass of water would come very handy. A few went to the to the faucet <laughs> and filled up the glasses of water. Then in the middle of the road, they realized that it's traditional. Gave him a glass of water and <clears throat> I asked, anybody came back? No, you're the first one to come back. A week or two later, I went back again Anyone else came back? No, nobody came back. Two or three weeks, I went asking. So she said that this gentleman, the lady, she told me, Pani Szymanska, <coughs> told me, no, you're the first one, and you're the last one to come back. There's nobody coming back. And while I was there, the first or second time, I have seen something like a little mural or something, a little artwork that my mother was working for a year on it, years. And when I saw that, it was such a, a wonderful feeling, like a feeling back home from then. Oh, I say, I remember that. Then the radio was playing, and there was the, the old-fashioned cabinets, you know, the, the carved wood, I saw that, I said, oh, I remember that. That was a big mistake. <clears throat> One day I went in, the last time I wanted to go in, a couple in front of our building called me by the Polish name, <coughs> Jusek, Jusek, Ochtute, come here. I was afraid to go. They kneel themselves down, they make a cross over their body, they pray, big me, come, come. I went, approached to them, and they said, we knew your parents, we are so sorry that they didn't come back. They were so nice to us, they helped us when we needed help. Anyway, we overheard something, you recognize things in your house, and we overheard something, the boys are planning, they're planning something the other day. Really? Right away I made a, a U-turn and never went. <coughs> because there was a lot of people after the war that they came back and were trying to claim their property or whatever. I was not interested in any property. I, was, uh, I didn't need anything. I, uh, I had what I needed. And uh, the only thing I needed family and I didn't have any family. So. Uh, I just made a new turn and went back, never went in again. And then I thought to myself, <clears throat> if I survived, where millions didn't survive, there might be a purpose in my, in my survival. What do I do? I remember the story that my father with my uncle in the world time, we're talking about children when they took away their parents. They took their children, they stuck them wherever they could, to churches, <coughs> to monasteries, to orphanages, 
to, to barns, to stables with the bahenas. They just put them away that the Goyim should take them to private rooms. They put children on the stairs of the building that the, the Goyim that should take them. So I, I thought to myself, I said, we lost six million. We cannot afford losing any more. What do we do? What do I do? What can we do to recover all those children? Those were little children, one year, two years, three years. Where are they? Anyways, I was thinking and thinking and planning and planning and I had meetings with the Sheva Saplata with the, with the leftovers of the, whoever survived. So they came together uh, from three cities. They came together in Poland, from Warsaw, from Lodz, and Krakow. They were a little bit here, a little bit there. So there were three presidents under the communist regime, of course. They, they were good, good communists, that's why they're presidents. And because the, the communist regime allowed them to be the leaders of the Jewish people. So I was talking to them and I said there are so many Jewish children around somewhere. We have to do something to find them. I didn't have any big help from them. But I knew somebody that knew somebody. And I knew that if I would want to do something, I had to have a tremendous power, the, the biggest authority. So how do I get that? So somebody, somebody, somebody. There was a general, Ladislav Gelecki. He was the head of the UBE. UBE was a fearful expression in Poland after the war. It's like the KGB or something. They killed people who were not a communist. They, they made them a, a head shorter. I had to get to that head. How do you get to him? Those people, those people. One day, Baruch Hashem, I shook hands with him, and he told me, who are you, what do you who are we? I told him, me and uh, I had two friends that I was with him. Yeah, what do you want to do? T tell him, then, telling him about Jewish, it's a lost case right away. By communism, there's no Jewish, there's no sense. It's, it's trade, it's, it's non-kosher. The Rebbeinu gave me a wonderful idea. And when he asked me, what do you want to do? I had to give an answer. So I said, I want to unite families that the Nazis have separated. Yeah. Oh, that was music to his ears. I said, how are you going to do with a friend or two friends? You are not going to be able to do that. I'll give you help. I'll give you people. Professionals. I'll give you 20 people in uniforms and I'll give you 20 people as detectives and civilian. And I'll give you weaponry. But you have to be their chief. They don't, they don't, they're professionals, but they don't know what to do. I will be the chief. I, weapons. I said, I don't know how to handle weapons. I don't Don't worry. One of our officers will take you out in the field and in, 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 in one hour you'll know how to do it. And it can't happen. And we started, I got everything I wanted, and we started working. And started walking in the, the dark, in Captain the Finster, you know how they say, Captain the Finster. And we started working, went to churches, had to fight with the Galuchim, with the priests. And the covenant of the priests didn't have much to do. I had a little bit come on that. We have to go to the, um, uh, the monasteries, fight with the mother superiors. And sometimes I wasn't very gentle with them, I can tell you. I was quite brutal because they wouldn't cooperate. They wouldn't let us go around and find the Jewish children. And how to find the Jewish children. It's not, it wasn't me. And Baruch Hashem, one year worked under terrible, terrible conditions, under hard, hard job. A one-year job salvaged 600 Jewish children, got in touch with Rav Herzog, who was the chief rabbi of Palestine. He recommended me an office in Paris, 
when there was a man in charge of the illegal Aliyah, Aliyah, um, read the name, not the name this moment. Um, the name was Yitzhak Rafael, whoever remembered that name. He became the Minister of Immigration in Israel, the first Medina. Um, I worked with him and he helped and gave the joint. And under the table they came in all kinds of Zionist organizations. I didn't see them, I didn't hear them, I helped whenever I could. After a year, we dispatched all those children to Italy, to a port city, Trieste, Trieste, put them on a boat and sent them to Palestine. The British didn't let them in, rerouted them to Cyprus. Eventually, when the Medina was created, they brought all those children back in, and from those children they built the beautiful mishpuchas, great families. And so there was a, a covers at all to that Jewish Medina that made people back to people, marry, brought up doyers, a lot of them from the created beautiful mishpuchas, and we owe them our Torah Satov. We cannot be against them, whether they're 100% religious people. Not everybody is religious. Yisrael Achal Pishachotu Yisrael. So we, we owe them our Torah. The other thing, I wasn't happy with what I did. I said, I have to do something else. I have to go and find all those murderers that led the concentration camps in which I was in. There was a lot of them, more than a thousand concentration camps all over. In Poland, in, in, in Ukraine, in, 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 in Romania, and in Germany, in Austria, in many places. <clears throat> so I went after my, my murderers. The, my first on the list was Amon Gerd, the Butcher of Flasher. Did I tell you how we built Flasher? Probably I didn't tell you. They took us, I'm going back now, they took us, <coughs> a few hundred people, maybe a thousand people, and they put us behind earth movers. They took a Beisachayim in Krakow called Yerushalimska and they came with earth movers and those beasts, those German beasts, those Nazis were not happy enough to kill the living ones. But they wanted not to let the dead ones rest in peace. So they came with heavy machine and earth movers and destroyed all the Kvorim. And there was bones and remains all over and flooded out the land. I have to wait, go with a shovel behind those machines, collect the bones, put it on a wheelbarrow that the guy was near me on the left side. And then they took the all the bones, they dumped it wherever the Nazis told them to dump it. And we leveled out that whole base of Chayim, became a, a flat piece of land called Plasho. On that piece of land, we built 200 barracks, barracks, 200 homes. There was no sechel anymore of the Jewish uh, cemetery. But there was something, the, uh, the, the, the Nazi uh, uh, regime needed iron for the war machine. So around the cemetery, there were heavy iron bars. The, 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 the fence around them. So I had a, nest, a big nest there. They put me, there were big columns, bricks. Put me on top of the bricks to chop down the, the bricks. Not to break a brick, break a brick but to chop them out and throw them down gently to someone to pick them up. 
Ammon get passed by, one day passed by, and of course when he passed by, we were not normal, we were all shaken. And when I chopped up that brick and threw it down to that man, he didn't catch it. So he said, come here, to took out the gun. He walks over to me, he said, throw down brick to me. I chopped, 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 chopped. With his palpitation, I threw the down brick to him very gently. He didn't catch it either. Come down. So I had to finish my story. And what happened, I don't know. I'm here. So nothing happened. But what happened was, a few days later, I woke up in the, in the Revere, in the hospital of the camp. And I'm, I'm totally chopped up. Open skin, open skin, bandaged, it hurt, everything hurt me. What happened? What happened? A block total, I can't remember. What happened? I don't know. Why am I so. Anyways, when they released me from the hospital and I came a little bit to myself, <coughs> chopped up all everything, but I started to be hungry. That was a good sermon that, that I started feeling better. And I forgot to tell you what happened before. Before, when I was in Pasha, when I was hungry, I decided I'll go to the Jewish police chief, Hilevich. He is always walking together around the camp with the, with Amon Get, with a big butcher. And I told him, I will shine your boots. So I said, come in every morning before the siren. Not every morning, it, uh, once a week, twice a week. So I did, and he gave me a piece of bread, gave me a little soup, gave me a bagel, a shine, whatever, whatever. Everything was good. So he knew me, and he was always with Philippe. When I feel better, came out of the hospital, and so I went to him in the morning, very early, and he opened the door, and he said, oh, you're alive. I say, yeah, yeah, I'm alive, yeah. I saved your life. How? What? Do you remember the story I told me? It's like, remember he told you to come down? You may, remember you came down, you were all full of blood, uh, the, the knees and the, the hands. And, and you know that he took out his gun, you remember? I started to. I started beating you up, you fainted, you fell on your face, you lying on the floor. You know what I told him? Save your bullet, he's dead. That was one of the big miracles. And that Hilevich was going with him and helping him in all the terrible things. When they liquidated the camp in Plasha, what did he do? He shot him. He was a big helper. Why did he shot him? Because he knew too much. So, I didn't finish my work. I have to get those murderers. How do I get them? I had a lot of experience in Poland with the children, interrogating families, interrogating nurse, the, the nurses in the home, uh, the, 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 the seminary, what is it called, monasteries, and then all of those people, also private homes. I had a lot of experience. So I started, I became a policeman in Austria, in Bad Ischl. And as a policeman, I, I, I approached the American occupation army, you know, the, the, the American occupied part of Germany. There were four Allied forces. There were the Russians, there were the Americans, and the British, and the French. Everybody had a zone. I was in the American zone. So I went to the American uh, authority and I said, I want to go Nazi hunting for those murderers that I was in their concentration camp. I got a uniform, I got a weapon, I got a gun. I got papers, document, and the authority, the occupation army in Germany was called CID, 
central intelligent detachment. Doesn't exist anymore. But uh, to make my movie, they had to go to the authorities in Washington and to ask them for boxes from the trials. And they took, they found out there, they found my name, they found my doing, you know, they had a lot of documentation there. So I started to first one to look is Ramon Gert. Interrogating families, interrogating <coughs> friends, interrogating enemies. I got a lot of information about enemies. Because why enemies? Neighbors became enemies. Because the Nazis, the Nazis, the, the SS had everything. There were shortages in Germany. People didn't have any in the wartime much. But the SS and the Hitler and the Gestapo, they had everything. So there was jealousy from the enemies, from the neighbors. Jealousy, kinnebring, sinne, you know. I got a lot of information I could follow. And Baruch Hashem, I got him. And when I got him, I beat him and I screamed and I yelled. People ask me, why didn't you shoot him? I said, shooting him would be giving him a gold medal for his atrocities, suffering. Anyways, I beat him, I did, I was reprimanded by the authorities, I shouldn't have beaten him. I put him in a cell, I said, he's an important individual, important prisoner, I put him in a cell. He never opened his mouth. I went in twice to his cell, a small little cell, confined in a cell. And I asked him, why did you kill Mr. Spielman? Why did you hang Mr. Kammer? Why, did, why, why, why? Not a single word. Brought him to court, brought him to justice, brought witnesses, the judges, the pr 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 prosecutor, the defense, he wouldn't open his mouth. The only time he opened, yeah, he was condemned to die by hanging in, in Germany. And two weeks before the execution, the Polish government came in and said, stop, you cannot do it. Why? We want him extradited to Poland because all his crimes were committed in Poland. Me as an individual, <coughs> I was very happy. Give him again, start again, all that thing. Let him, let him suffer a little bit more. I don't know whether he suffered. He wanted to die a long time ago because... Uh, anyway, he didn't open his mouth. But they took him to the... When the last moment when they took him to the gallows, the judge asked him anything to say. Would you want to say anything? He said, yes, the first time. What do you want to say? Nish Nish, not guilty. That was it. And he was saying, and Plasher on the same spot where he hanged other people. Same spot. That was him. And then I ran after Julius Ludorf, the, the good guy that uh, I saw uh, shine his shoes. And he was in the concert. I was good to him. He had everything by me. I said, yes, but all those slaps and all those kicks. And even if you were good to me, but you were bad to everybody else. You killed people, you hanged people. You pushed people to the fences. It was a case where he pushed the people to the fence. The, 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 the wire, the barbed wire was electrified. And they were just killed there. And I then went on about another few things about how the, the, the commandant from Ebenezer was guns, guns like the finance minister here. Yeah. Not the finance minister, the war, the, the defense minister. So I brought Hashem brought six of those Nazis that murdered thousands, 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 hundreds of thousands of Jews, brought them to justice. And then I didn't know what to do with myself. Finish the job. And I was involved with a lot of Zionists leaders because as a young man, young boy in Poland, I belong to an organization called Yavne, also to Chalveitzia, and I was always from home, built in myself, Hamas Yisrael, Eretz Yisrael, 
I used to sing, in my body I sang a song, they asked me to sing the song about Nancy Sewell when you were a child. When you were a little boy, how do you know about Nancy Sewell? What about Nancy Sewell? I said, I'll tell you. I used to sing a song in Yarme. And the song was as follows, I'll do it. Eretz is home in my entire land. All the ganze Welt bist in der Bekannt. Zwischen Tull und Teichen ist nicht du kein Gleichen. Eretz is home in my entire land. And we used to dance, 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 and sing that song. Eretz is home in my entire land. Whoever understands Yiddish, it is an Yiddish song. We use, Yiddish used to be the language of the Jewish people. Wherever I came to any country, and to many countries I went, and I found Yin, I speak Yiddish, I felt at home. And after the war, I wanted to, I had a lot of Zionist friends, they all became ministers here. And they came to me, they said, Yo Saleh, I, we want you to go and study, because I had no education. In the concentration camp, there was no other education. We want you to study, we will need politicians. One day we'll have a Medina. I, I assure you, one day we'll have a Medina. Okay, one day we'll, we want you to study. I said, let me think about it. Then I had a friend that his Zayde, his grandfather, was the dean of Yeshiva University, Arab Shmuel Belkin, whoever remember that name. Arab Shmuel Belkin wrote me letters and letters, he wanted me to come to learn Yeshiva, he would do everything for me, I should come, I should come, I should come. I said, let me, let me think about it. And I was thinking, and I was a policeman in a DD camp in Austria called Badejo, and to that camp, all different delegations came from America, from Canada, from Australia, from different places to bring immigrants to the surf from the survivors. And I said, let me think about it. And I was thinking, what do I do with myself? I have finished my job in Europe. And I don't want to stay in Europe. One day my problems were solved. I got up in the morning and I see after the war there were people in other countries not in Europe, whether it was in South America, North America, or in other countries, they were looking for families. They were searching through the International Red Cross families, all to see who survived from their families in Europe. So, one day my problem was solved. I see somebody in Argentina is looking for my father, for my mother, for my grandfather, grandmother, uncle, and the same name left of it, Israel, Argentina. I, know very, I knew very little about Argentina. I didn't even know where it was, but I knew that I knew the name Argentina. Why? As a child, letters used to come from Argentina. And I was fighting with my siblings about the stamps that were so different from the stamps that we knew in Europe. I, was, I knew about Argentina, but where is Argentina? I didn't have a passport, so I answered that call, and that person in Argentina, he was a great uncle, he was a brother of my grandfather. He sent me a ticket to come to Argentina. And in Europe, I, as I said before, I had everything, I had a lot of power. I didn't have money because money, Hours more than I had everything I needed. And I decided I have everything, but I'm dying for one thing that I don't have. What is that? Family. Since Argentina has family, I go to Argentina. Family. So I went, I had to get a passport. I, don't, I didn't have anything. I, went, I didn't know when I was born. Again, to friends and friends and friends. They had a council and a council in Toulouse in France. I should go to Toulouse in France and get a passport. Tell him I said I went to Toulouse and came to that council. You know, right away 
make the pictures, get your passport, get an hour, I had a passport. Okay. And then I got a ticket to come by boat to Argentina. So I went in Vienna to, because I was st stationed in the police near Vienna and a bad issue. Uh, so I went to Vienna to the Argentinian uh, consul, gave me a form. <coughs> I filled out the form and the consul came out and told me, scrap out Jewish, put Christians, I'll give you a visa. I yelled at him like hell. I said, you are going to tell me to do that? I was five years suffering because I was a Jew. Now that I am liberated and I am free, and I am proud of being Jewish, you want me to lie? I'm not lying, I'm not going to do it. He said, I can't give you a visa. I said, give it. I had to do still some, something in Germany, so I went to Munich to the Argentinian Council and asked for a visa. <coughs> Gave me a form, I filled out the form. Council came back and said the same thing. I said, I'm not going to do it. I can't give you a visa. I figured my boat is leaving from France, from La Havre, a French port. I have to be in France anyway, so I'll go to Paris to the Argentinian Council. I went to the Argentinian Council in Paris, he gave me a form, I felt on the form, handed it over, came back with it, put Christian. So I saw it. I'm lost, what do I do now? Going back to Europe now? I have a person, I always like to go front, front, not backward. In Yiddish they say, a cosigate of Zurich. Whoever understands me. I am not going to go back. And I'm thinking, what am I doing? I'm in a predicament here. Stay in France? Nah, not a, not a, my choice. And I heard that the boat, for Rosa, was the name of the boat, is going to America. It will stop in Rio de Janeiro loading coffee, Brazilian coffee. Oh, I said, I have an idea. I went to the Brazilian consul and I said, look, I have a passport, I have a ticket to Argentina, and I just made up a story. I heard Brazil, Rio de Janeiro is so beautiful. It is. It is so beautiful. Would you mind to give me a transit visa to Brazil? It said it was a pleasure. Fine. I ended up in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro. I had seven dollars in my pocket. I didn't know one single word in Portuguese. And I didn't know a single person in Brazil. And Brazil is a big country. I went down the boat, I had a little suitcase. And I look around, it looks so different from from what I knew, and I say, where do I go here? Do I go right? Maybe go again left? I look at left, I don't see here nothing. Or do I go straight? Back I can't go because there's the um, the, um, the ocean, the boat is in the back. Anyway, I went straight. Went straight, came to a park, sat down, and I'm thinking. I fell asleep, slept the whole night in that park that bench. In the morning I said, I have to find a show. I have to go down. I have to go down somewhere. Where do I go? I look and look and walk and walk in the street. Walk, walk, walk. I see a yeet. I see a yeet. I ask him, Mr. Yeet? Yeah. I want to go to down. Okay. Come with me. I come to a show. See people. Everybody comes to me. Where come you when you come? I told them the story. Can you come to, to, tonight to eat by me? Can you come tomorrow to me? Uh, shop is it? I had already friends. Urashia. A lot of friends. Then I got a job. And I started working. And I got money. And then I got... I learned the, the, the language. I already learned the language. I knew the language. You know, and I was there about for six months. 
and I, I almost didn't want to go further. But that relative, that great uncle, he wanted me to come to Argentina. I said, so what do I do? I went in, 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 in Rio de Janeiro to the Argentinian consul. They wouldn't give me a visa either. So what do I do? So that great uncle, everything was by letters, letters, no telephone, no, no, no. Uh, yeah, telegram, telegrams. We used to take two, three words, put them together because every word cost it. So the, the combined words, uh, telegrams and letters. So that great uncle had an idea for me to go to Paraguay from, from Rio de Janeiro. From Brazil to Paraguay, to uh, the city, the main, the capital city, Asuncion. And there he had a business associate, and the business associate knew the police chain, I got on some mindset. Anyway, I became born in Paraguay. I became, I got a, a, a birth certificate born in Paraguay. I got an ID card born in Paraguay. I got a passport in Paraguay. I learned Spanish a little bit. I was there for three, four weeks in Paraguay. Learned Spanish. Because, and then I had to take a hydroplane on the Rio de la Plata from Asuncion to Buenos Aires. And on the plane was the immigration from the Argentine immigration. And I had to know what to do. I knew already. He came over from the paper. Oh, uh, uh, how long did you want to visit? Yeah, my uncle. Anyway, I came to Argentina. I had a hard time later to pull back, to make all those false papers, to make them right. It was a hard job left. And I was in Argentina for uh, eight years in Buenos Aires. And then I met my wife in Colombia. I was five years in Colombia. I had two children in Colombia. And then I was for 60, for 57 years I was living in Montreal, Canada. I had one son in Canada. And after, when I was 88 years old, I decided it's about time. Go back, go back home. Go back where you belong. Everybody was against me. All my friends had a lot of friends in Montreal. And the family, daddy, what are you doing? Well, why? I decided. That if I'm not going now, I'll never go. Came to Amsterdam, and Baruch Hashem, I'm here, and I'm very happy, and I'm just praying that there should be shulim in Amsterdam. We should be able to get rid of our neighbors, of our enemies. They shouldn't be any more any enemies, and we should have shulim about among ourselves here. And I'd like, and, and if we will have actors. We will deserve it to the Moisa Mashiach and to the rebuilding of the Besamikdash. And hopefully next year we will dance in the streets with Tafnaches and it will be a big yontif. Amen.